I don't understand everything about the book of Revelation, but it is exciting to know a few things, and that's what I'm going to try to share today. And I, in the past, have presented this chapter, but I think I've understood a little, a few things better as a result of continuing to study. And I'm sure if I presented this again in a year or two years, the same thing would happen. I'd be able to say, wow, I've learned so much more. And so we all have the opportunity to learn and grow and try to understand what it is that God is saying to us. And so having just prayed together, I'm looking forward to going into Revelation chapter 10. You can see there are six churches in the first few chapters of the Revelation that have Christ within the church. It's kind of hard to see it, but he's there. Now, a difference in between the seventh and the other six previous churches is that Christ is outside of the church. He's knocking, trying to get in. So the Laodicean church is a little bit different than every other church. Well, you can see that there's a difference between the sixth and the seventh, okay? In the seals of chapters 6 and onward, you find that there are six seals that are mentioned, and then there's a difference with the seventh, in that there's something between the sixth and the seventh. It's actually chapter 7 with the 144,000. The question is asked after the mountains fall and the kings and the counselors and the captains and the chief men and the, and the slaves and the bondmen and the freemen, they are all crying out for the rocks and the mountains to fall on, this, fall on them, to hide them from the face of him that sits upon the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. The Lamb is the one coming in the second coming. It's not the Father coming with him. But what we see is that they cry out this question, who shall be able to stand? And you find the answer in that little interlude between chapters, or the uh, sixth seal and the seventh seal. It's chapter 7, the 144,000. So it's like there's a, something a little different with the seventh seal in that there's a space between the sixth and the seventh. Just like there's something different with the seventh church in that there, there's Christ outside of the church trying to get in, right? Well, it's very similar with the trumpets as well. You have this concept where you have the six trumpets, which we've gone over already in chapters 8 and 9, and then there's that break or interlude between the sixth trumpet and the seventh. Right now we're in that interlude, kind of like we were studying chapter seven, which is between the sixth and the seventh seal. We're now in chapters 10 and 11, which is in between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. So that's kind of the, the model of the book of Revelation that you can fit yourself into. And you can realize that there's a span of time in the churches a span of time in the seals, a span of time in the trumpets, and they all kind of cover the same ground. Now, it's not the same exact thing. You're looking at it from different perspectives, you see. And when you're looking at the same history from different perspectives, you can come away with different ideas, different conclusions, different thoughts. Well, that's what's happening here. And we've already talked about how that in the sixth uh, church, there was a special group of people that came up. Well, they went sour in the seventh church, right? Well, there's that special people that are the 144,000 in the sixth seal, and they're focused on in that interlude. Well, there's that special group of people that was in the sixth trumpet, and they're mentioned and sp specifically um, ex uh, explained a bit more in the interlude between the sixth and the seventh trumpet. So you can see that we're there again, with that same time frame. Now, let's think about this for a second. If the churches go from the time of Christ until the second coming of Christ, if the seals go from the time of Christ to the second coming of Christ, which is probably the easiest to show that in, but then if you have the trumpets go from the time of Christ until the second coming of Christ, and right now we're studying the between the sixth and the seventh trumpet, well, you're pretty close to the end of time. I mean, if, if you just understood the layout of the churches, the seals, and the trumpets from the time of Christ to the second coming of Christ, then uh, you've gone pretty far in time from since the time of Christ, and you're getting closer to the second coming of Christ. Well, guess what? That's the truth. And you can see in the movement of the sixth seal, where everybody's looking for Christ's coming, and they're wanting 
to hide themselves from the one that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb who's coming in the clouds of heaven, they are afraid because it's the second coming. Well, that's because the seals have shown us through time what's going on. Well, the same thing with the trumpets. And here you can see a very similar situation. For example, the sixth trumpet, uh, sorry, the sixth seal talks about the falling of the stars, the sun becoming dark, the moon turning to red. You have this great earthquake that shakes many things. And then you have the destruction of the world where mountains are moving out of their place and islands are fleeing away. There is natural destruction occurring during the time that Christ is coming. Well, okay, you could look at the trumpets and you find just what we read last time we were together, right at the end. You can read the final two verses of chapter 9 and recognize that those that were committing idolatry and they were sorcerers, they were murderers, they were evil, they were all these sorts of things. They were contrary to God's will. They're existing as well. Now, what does that mean? Well, just like in the sixth seal, there was a bunch of natural catastrophe. Well, in the sixth trumpet, there's a bunch of spiritual catastrophe. These people are contrary to God's will. They're breaking all of his commandments and they're not repentant. So you can see that there's like the ecclesiastical trouble, which is over in the seventh ch uh, church, where Christ is outside trying to get in because he's not welcome anymore. That means inside... It is spiritless. It is Christ spiritless. So you have that church, it's like ecclesiastical catastrophe. Well, you have natural catastrophe in the sixth seal, and in the seventh trump, uh, sixth trumpet, you also have the spiritual catastrophe. So now you're seeing where you're at in this history of what's going on in the churches, the seals, and the trumpets. Well, that's where we enter into chapter 10, is because God, he wants to demonstrate himself as one that is able to, as described in the book of Daniel, and also in the book of Exodus, he is one that can raise up a people, okay? And that to me is exciting, because I frankly, truly, really want to be on God's side. I have many years in the past, from you know, early on in my, well, I started smoking at seven and drinking at nine. And so my lifestyle before that was bad, but it went pretty south quickly after I started smoking and drinking at seven years and nine years old, and then finally doing drugs at 10. Well, in my teens, I went down very far, very fast. And so I've served Satan. I served him well, very diligently, but I don't want to serve him anymore. I want to be 100% on God's side. I do. I truly do, and I, I want my life to reflect that. And so, this idea that God has a people on the earth, I like that. In fact, I want to be part of it. And, you see, I've learned so much in my experience in the past where I thought that I had the truth, and I was really excited and sharing it with as many people as I could, and then I learned more, and I did the same thing. I shared it with as many people as I can, and then I learned more, and then I started sharing more and more, and now I'm still learning more, and I want to share and so I, I still want to continue learning and being God's person, right? God's child, part of his family, the ministry that he has going on in this world. And so if you're feeling that same thing I am, then I think you're going to like chapter 10, because it's really God lifting up a people out of the rubbish of this spiritual wickedness that you just read at the end of the sixth trumpet. For yourself, read those last two verses in chapter 9. And realize that they are not repenting of their sins. But I want to be one of those guys that turns away from those things. I want to repent. I want to be different. So that's the, the setting of chapter 10. And now we're going to look into it. So I'm going to share my screen. And we're going to try to understand a little bit more of what's being said there. In Revelation chapter 10. I saw another. So there's already been one. But I saw another mighty angel. Now, an angel is a messenger. We know that Christ has been a messenger. His angels are messengers. You could be an angel because you could be a messenger. If you're willing to share what God has for others through you, then God has called you to be an angel or a messenger. I saw another mighty angel. So who is this angel? Come down from heaven. He was clothed with a cloud. Wow, clothed with a cloud. Now, wait a minute, clouds. So let's try to find out real quick what clouds are. We've done this before, but... Let's do it again in the context. We're going to see that who lays the beams of his chambers in the waters, as it says in Psalm 104, verse 3. 
who makes the clouds his chariot. Okay, let's understand that for a second. The clouds are his chariot. Now I'm just going to go up here and I'm going to add a comma and go to 68 verse 17. Thank you, Patrick, last time you helped me with that. And now I remember it again. The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. Okay, so the clouds are chariots and the chariots are angels. Okay, so the angels are being described here in Revelation chapter 10 as it says, I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with angels. Okay, this is all symbolic, so you can understand it as symbolic. The mighty angel is symbolic of somebody, and this somebody is clothed with angelic ministry, surrounded by. And a rainbow was upon his head. Now, really? I mean, you're going to say that that's not symbolic? Uh, somebody wears a rainbow on their head? No, that's symbolic. And what it means is, this person declares the glory of God. Now, why? Well, I, this angel, not this person. Well, it is a person. So this person, this angel, declares the glory of God. Why? Well, because God the Father in chapter 4 was the one that was surrounded by the, the uh, rainbow, remember? And the Son of God came in to where the Father was sitting in chapter 5, and that means the Son of God was surrounded by the glory of his Father, just as you read in Patriarchs and Prophets chapter 1. And so what we have here is in this chapter that Jesus Christ, I'm just going to say, is this mighty angel, and he is surrounded by the ministration of angels, and he's declaring the glory of his Father, which is the rainbow round about his head. Now, what is the glory of God? It's his character. And Jesus Christ had the Father's character. That's why it says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. That mind is his character. In fact, it's his father's character. It doesn't say, let this mind that was in Jesus, or sorry, let this mind that was Jesus's mind be in you. It doesn't really say that. What it says is, let that mind be in you, or let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So it's a mind, it's a spirit, a life, that was in Christ. What spirit was that? Well, you just read the Bible and it's very clear. John chapter 10, uh, 14, verse 10, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, and there are other places where you find it was God the Father that was in his Son. Like, for example, 2 Corinthians 5, 19, God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. So this mind that Christ had was where the glory or over his head, the glory of God was shown, right? So the Spirit of God was in Christ, this angel messenger that was surrounded by the angelic ministry. And he was here on the earth as well. He had two angels by him every time he went anywhere. And of course, that's because he was the mercy seat, according to the Bible. And the mercy seat had two angels that were connected to it. And so God the Father would speak from between those two cherubim, and of course God spoke through his Son, who had those two cherubim by him all the time. The sanctuary is described in the life of Christ. It's beautiful. So here what we have is Christ surrounded by that ministration of angels, and he has God's glory or character that is round about his head. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, right? So that's the idea. And his face was, as it were, the sun. Now the sun is shining in its strength, and his face is the countenance of the Father. As it says in the Bible, let your countenance shine upon us, right? So the face or the countenance of the Father was shown through the sun, which is S-O-N, capital S-O-N, and here it's as it were the sun, so it's symbolic that the sun is shining in its strength. You can read that same thing in Revelation chapter 1, and you read it also in, Ch in Daniel chapter 10 as well. And his feet were as pillars of fire. Okay, pillars of fire. I'm going to see. How many times does the Bible use this phrase, pillars of fire? Oh, only one time. Okay, so we don't really have pillars of fire, but we do have, if you change this up just a little bit, in fact, I'm going to come up close to it, and I'm going to put a, a quote here, take off the S, put an asterisk, and then I'm going to put another quote here. So what that's looking for is the word pillar or pillars of fire or pillared 
pillaring, whatever that is, anything that comes after the R, that's what that asterisk does. It actually, it's a wild card, and it says anything that has this word or these letters here and something after it, then include that everything with that something after it. And so when I hit that enter now, I'm going to see that there's seven different times right here that that word comes up or that phrase comes up. The Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud to lead them the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light to go by day and night. That means that God was with them 24-7. How? He was with them through this pillar of cloud. We know that angels are clouds and we know that there's a pillar of fire and we know that angels are flames of fire according to Hebrews chapter 1. So it's the Lord that went before them how? In a pillar of cloud and in a pillar of fire. Now, you might be saying, wait a minute, preacher, that's Christ that was with him. Yes, I think it was. In fact, the Bible teaches that the spirit is the presence. Okay, you can read that. Just look up the word spirit and presence. There's only two verses in all the Bible that include the words spirit and presence. They're both in the book of Psalms. It's 139 and 51. So if you look at those two together, you recognize that the Spirit is equated to or equal to the presence. So if I have in me the Spirit of God, if I have the mind, the life, the character of God in me, then, and if I walk into the room with you, you are in the presence of Christ. Now that's not because I'm Christ. It's because the Spirit of Christ is with me, you see. And if you walk into somebody's room and you have Christ with or in you, which is the spirit of Christ, the mind of Christ, the life of Christ, the actual presence of Christ, then you're bringing the presence of Christ. That doesn't mean Christ has left, physically left heaven to come down and stand within you in that room. No, it doesn't mean that at all. That would be actually quite creepy. But what it does mean is that the mind, life, and spirit of Christ is in you. And therefore, you are bringing the influence of the Spirit of Christ. You see, so what we have here is this beautiful picture of Christ with his people in the pillar of cloud and in the pillar of fire. Now, that means Christ and angels. It doesn't mean that Christ actually left, physically left heaven to come down and be with his people as a pillar of cloud and as a pillar of fire. Now, could he have? Yes, sure. Why not? But... Did he necessarily? Well, not necessarily. He could have been there just by his spirit. And it would be just as thoroughly as if he came down here personally. It would be Christ with his people. Okay? So don't think I'm saying it's not Christ. I'm saying it maybe a little differently than I had believed it before. That's what I'm saying. And if you can prove me wrong, I'll listen to you. Though you're, you're going to have to use the Bible. Okay, that, that's the foundation. That's what we're talking about. Christ in you, the hope of glory, does not mean that Christ actually physically leaves heaven and jumps inside of you. It means his spirit, his word, his character, his life is in you. Now, can I explain all those details? No, I can't. But I can rejoice in the fact that it is Christ with me. But he's also still before the Father, who is in heaven, and he's able to minister on my behalf as the only mediator between God and men. Now, what do I mean God in heaven? Well, we've talked about this before, but I think it's important to refer to. The reason being is I keep growing in this understanding, and I keep trying to explain, and I'm using frail English language to try to do so, okay? You could try to use Swahili if you'd like. It, it just wouldn't work as well because we're frail, we're human. We don't have the ability to speak the language of Canaan. And even Sister White was saying, oh, that I could speak the language of Canaan. And you might have a few grapes that are there, right? So the idea of God being in heaven is very important for us to understand. Let me break it down just very quickly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. If God is everywhere, then everywhere is heaven. And that means that if God is with you now, then you are in heaven. And there's no need for Christ to come to take you from earth to heaven because you're already there. Because God is there. And God is everywhere. And where God is, is heaven. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. God, our Father, is in heaven. Ask his Son. Just look in the book of Matthew. Go to the words, Father, heaven. And you'll find that the Father is in heaven. Every single time God says, or Christ says, that the Father is in heaven. Now, if God is everywhere, everywhere is heaven. And then that means right now, 
that Kenya is heaven. And you can look around and see outside and realize that, wow, heaven is the same yesterday as it was uh, today. And I don't like it today just as much as I didn't like it yesterday. Heaven is not Kenya. I love Kenya. It was a beautiful place to be. But heaven is not California either where I'm at. And so God is in heaven. It's a real place. And God is there. Now, God is also here by his spirit, but that doesn't mean he leaves heaven physically and comes down here, you see. So God can be here by his, in, with his presence, in his presence, by his spirit, also being in heaven. And it's not a disembodied something, okay? It's actually in those that he uses as his agents, whether it be his word, even nature. But that doesn't mean God is in the flower, in the seed, and in the plant, etc. No, his character, his, his life, you can see his attributes in nature. Therefore, God is in nature in that sense. God is in his agents like you and me. That doesn't mean I'm divine. It just means that I have his mind, his character, his life. Okay, So that's the idea of the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire. You have Christ with those people, which were the children of Israel. But I don't think that necessarily means that Christ, the Son of God, left heaven to actually physically be there. Now, did he? Yes, he did. You can see it in the story of Genesis chapter 18 and 19, where Abram actually worshipped the Lord. And the Lord didn't tell him not to. Therefore, it was Christ. It wasn't one of the angels. By the way, he was mentioned as an angel. And there are three angels there. <laughs> There's the angel of the Lord and the two other angels. That means there was three angels that had messages that went into Sodom to declare the judgment that's coming before the judgment came. You see, so you have that little scenario of the three angels with uh, Abram and Lot and everybody there referred to as a microcosm of the end of time and the big picture of what was going on really in that story. So, oh, rather at the end of time. So anyways, pillar of fire, pillar of fire in Exodus. It's in Exodus again. It's in Numbers. You can see it for in Nehemiah. And then you finally see it in Revelation. I'm not going to go through all the times that are there because you can do it for yourself, but you're going to have to just take out that S and put an asterisk there with quotes on either side. Okay. That's how you're going to find those. So his feet were like the pillars of fire. Well, when did he have pillars of fire? It was in the Old Testament. It was when he was leading his people up out of Egypt. And that, by the way, is what's happening here in Revelation chapter 10. Christ has been sent as this mighty angel. He is connected with the clouds, which was like in the Old Testament, which is the ministration of the angels. The character of God is in his mind or around his head. And he is showing the glory of his father. And he's leading his people up out of Egypt, just like he did back in the day. Well, wait a minute, what's happening? Well, just as it is described, as I was saying earlier, where you're at the end of the churches, you're at the end of the seals, you're at the end of the trumpets, what time is that? Well, it's the 1840s. And in the 1840s, right around that time with the Philadelphian church, with the time where they believed Christ was coming, where there was like, for example, the uh, falling of the stars, there was the great earthquake, there was the, the sun becoming dark and the moon be turning like blood. All of that was coming around in the 17, late 1700s, early 1800s. And so the, even the seal, the sixth seal, brings you to that time. And you can see that in the sixth trumpet, it brings you to 1840, right? August 11. And so all of this is pointing to the 1800s, 1840s specifically. And here you have God raising up a people just like he did in the Old Testament. You have the pillar of fire, you have the cloud, you've got all the beauty of what God did in the Old Testament, bringing his people up out of Egypt, except in the New Testament, not coming out of Egypt, we're coming out of Babylon. And by the way, in a series on the book of Exodus, I'm going verse by verse through the book of Exodus, and it is mind-blowing to me. I'm learning so much as I'm going through that book, because what's happening is I am learning firsthand from the biblical account of how God has been and will be and will continue to do his work in bringing his people up out of Babylon at the end of time. It's all pictured in the story of Exodus. And what's beautiful is that in Revelation 15, we're going to be singing the song of Moses and of the Lamb. Well, who does that? It's those that have victory of the beast, his image, his number, and his mark, right? So if you go to Revelation 15, you realize that the song of Moses and the Lamb brings you all the way back to Exodus, but it's really coming up out of Babylon, okay? So the, the two stories work very well together, and that's why here... In Revelation 10, you're seeing God bringing his people up out of Babylon, but it looks very much like when he brought them up out of Egypt, okay? And the reason being is the stories correlate, in, like, magically. It's, it's incredible. Anyways, going back here to verse 2, he had in his 
hand, a little book opened. What is this little book? Okay, this little book open. I'm going to just uh, see what f where that phrase comes from. It only comes up in this verse, only one time. Now, I'm going to see what little book is, and if you search for that phrase, you're going to find it comes up four different times. Where we just read it in Revelation 10, another time in 10, another time in 10, another time in 10. So four times the Bible uses that phrase little book, and every single time it is in um, the book of Revelation chapter 10. Well, there is other times, for example, in the Bible where we're told that just like it says in Revelation 10, people are supposed to eat the words of a book. Um, Ezekiel chapter 1, 2, and 3. In that area, you can read, it's actually 2 and 3, really. But you can find that God is asking Ezekiel to take that little book, or the, the scroll that was written, and eat it. It will become in his belly, it'll become sweet, but it'll become bitter later, right? Or sweet in his mouth, bitter in his belly. Same thing that happens in Revelation 10. So you can compare... Ezekiel uh, chapters 2 and 3 with Revelation 10. And then you find a similar thing there in um, Daniel chapter 10, where Daniel gets sick. It's actually in chapter 8 as well. He gets sick, like his belly is bitter, if you will. Not really, it doesn't say that. But he gets sick and he passes out, or in chapter 10 he gets ill as well. And so you can know that there's an illness that's going on with Daniel Kind of in the same scenario of the 1844 prophecy that you see in Daniel chapter 8 and also in chapter 10, which is right after the explanation of chapter 8 and 9, which is dealing with judgment as well, because chapter 10 of Daniel is dealing with judgment. It was actually the judgment of the Medo-Persian nation, but judgment was the issue. Well, guess what? The 1840s was a judgment issue as well. So you can see that the correlation between Daniel chapter 10 and Revelation chapter 10 is very uh, close. Why? Because they're both times of judgment. This is the 1840s we're talking about, not with Daniel chapter 10. Although, wait a minute. Yes, it is. It's dealing with the, the both those, those times. And so uh, when you start seeing the prophecies of the Bible and how they all work together, you realize, wow, the 1840s were really important to God. There was a special time that he was, that, 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 that was for him. Why? Well, because, okay, the sanctuary... It was on the earth during the time of Christ, right? That was the outer court scenario. Three and a half years he ministered, and that was a very important time for the Father. Well, when Christ was on the cross, he said, it is done. It is finished. Well, what was finished? The earthly court experience. Well, as he ascended, he entered into the holy place ministry, where he would be there for 1,810 years. You can find all this stuff, you know, just uh, studying the prophecies of Daniel 8. But in this 1810 years, he's in the holy place, which is up in heaven. And that was a very special time for God the Father. But Jesus said something very interestingly, where in the sixth, or I'm sorry, seventh vial, which is the final plague of Revelation 16, he says, it is done. Well, what is done? Well, the uh, holy place ministry where Christ is interceding on behalf of God's people, it is done. Where that's at the final judgment, the final close of probation, he's not going to be praying for anybody anymore. Well then, in the final phase, which is the judgment phase, to see the, the ministry of Christ in the holy place interceding on behalf of God's people actually goes into a little bit into the time of judgment, which is past 1844. Well, so back now in 1844 and onward, actually through the time of the thousand years, and when we come back down to the earth, all that is the judgment period. And so what is what happens at the end of that time? Well, it says it again. It is done. You can read that in Revelation 21. So it is done for the, whole, for the outer court. It is done for the holy place. It is done for the most holy place. So those things are finished, right? And that's what's happening here in this experience of Christ, or rather why it's important for the um, 1840s, is because it was at a time where the holy place was done and the most holy place was starting, you see? And so that's why God is focusing on it in prophecy so much in the books of Daniel and the book of Revelation. And that's where we're able to see this concept that is described here in Revelation chapter 10. He had this little book open in his hand. That little book is found in the book of Daniel, right? And it's Daniel chapter 10. 
I lifted my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, kind of like what we see in Revelation chapter 10, whose loins were girded with fine gold of Uphaz. His body was like beryl, and his face was as the appearance of lightning, or like the sun, and his eyes were like lamp of fire, just like is described in Revelation chapter 10. And his arms and his feet were the color of polished brass, just like it's talking about in chapter 10, but the, uh, the flames of fire, which is like brass, is referring to the outer court ministry uh, here in Daniel and also in Revelation chapter 10. And the voice of his words was as the sound of a multitude. We're going to see in Revelation 10, the voice of his words as, as the sound of many waters. Okay, And you're going to see that all through this, even in Revelation chapter 1, verses 13 through 17 or 16, you're going to see the same kind of scenario. Christ is pictured in Daniel chapter 10, Revelation chapter 10, and Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 1 as well. So I'm going to go back here to this section of Revelation 10. He had this little book open, and that's what you find in Daniel. Go thy way, it says in the book of Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. And that was that little book that was, um, it is the book of Daniel that's that little book. And so here what you have is this book closed in the book of Daniel, but over in the book of Revelation, that little book is open, okay? Okay. So that's what we have here is this little book open, and that little book being the book of Daniel during the 1840s was opened. And how do we know that? Of course, because we know that William Miller was able to proclaim from the 1830s all the way, well, 1833 really, I think, in 34, all the way to 1844 where they thought that Christ was coming. Christ wasn't coming. What he was doing, he was moving from the holy place to the most holy place. The timing was right in that movement of what we know as the... Uh, the Great um, Awakening during the 1840s. You can find that actually in history. You just go to like Wikipedia and look up the Great Awakening and you find that there were different times in history where the Great Awakening was mentioned and, and noticed by people, that is, you know, during that time. But the, uh, the issue was here that this little book was understood or it was opened, the little book of Daniel. And so they thought that Christ was coming in 1844. Really, he wasn't. Later, they learned that he wasn't coming. He was just moving from the holy place to the most holy place. And this, what was happening is God was raising up his people during that time. Now, here's the thing. I have been a Seventh-day Adventist minister for a long time. And God was raising up the Seventh-day Adventist people during that time. Well, when I became a Seventh-day Adventist and started studying and was hired as a pastor full-time in the year 2000 and was working for many years after that, I didn't know that the church had actually gone astray from their, their original teachings. I didn't know that they come up with this different God based on the understanding of what happened through the studies of Froome with the coming of the Comforter and his finding that the people of other faiths had a different, and he thought, a better understanding of the Holy Spirit. And so he brought this idea into the church and they started promoting it and they published it and they put it into the seminaries and it went to the point where it just really, really caused the church to have problems. So finally in 1980, what they did is they voted officially to have the Trinity as their God, whereas they had never officially had that before. It was in some yearbooks and some things that some writings, even later in the life of Ellen White, you can see it in like Review and Herald, etc. But she never put her stamp on the Trinity, never was a Trinitarian. And so early, the early Seventh-day Adventist church was uh, the church that God raised up, which later went astray from that foundation. I was raised up in this astrayed found, um, church, and then I started studying the Bible for myself, actually going through the book of Revelation, which is what helped me understand differently about God. Well, I thought I was going get, to get in trouble from this, and I did. Uh, you know, the church didn't like the fact that I was teaching differently, and so I was actually cast out of the synagogue, which is fine. It didn't bother me a bit, but I'd rather follow truth. That's what I mean. But then I learned after a while, that's what the original church started teaching, is what I learned from my own study from the book of Revelation, that God is not a trinity. And man, I was blown away. So what God is, is revealing to me now is that God had been in the 1840s raising up his people with the real message, the real true Seventh-day Adventist message that's supposed to go to the world. I thought as a pastor that I had that message and I was sharing it with, with as many people as I could. And then I realized like, whoa, I was standing on the wrong foundation. That Jesus Christ was not my rock. I had a false Jesus Christ as my rock. I had a co-eternal, co-equal, something that always existed and, and is not biblical. And it was like three and one and one and three or three gods, depending on how you thought of it. And I realized at that time, it's not true. 
And so I have really appreciated this chapter because it is true that God was raising up his people like he raised his children of Israel up out of Egypt, just like he has led his people up out of Babylon. And the message of that time, the original Seventh-day Adventist message, is what God has been trying to raise up again, and it's working. It's going all over the world. I'm excited. And you can see that this is... Um, mentioned specifically by people like the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, who you can go to Fulcrum 7 and recognize that what he did in his, um, some address, I don't remember, it was right now, the date is um, October 2021. And if you look for the Fulcrum times where they highlighted the president of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, then you'll realize that uh, during that highlight that they wrote, the article, he specifically mentions Seventh-day Adventists, um, that are non-Trinitarian as those who should be cast out of the synagogue. And uh, I don't know if he said it specifically or if it was somebody's commentary on what he said. But anyways, it's, it's there and it's mentioned. And that's what they think now of those that had the original faith. Well, go to First Selected Messages, page 204, the second paragraph, and you realize that they would call the fundamental principles error. And this is just part of what has been prophesied. And we know now that God is raising up his people. So he's, he did it then in the 1840s. He's doing it again. There is a revival such as there has not been since apostolic times. It's happening right now. And I am so thankful that uh, I'm part of it. Now, I don't have everything right, but I'm, I'm trying to go that direction. I really want to be on God's team. And I believe he's leading me. And he's leading you. And he's, he's leading as many people as are willing to be led. So... This idea of what God is doing here with this open book is exciting to me. And I pray that uh, he, when he sets his feet on the sea and his left foot on the earth, it represents a worldwide movement, both sea and earth. That's everything. That's everywhere. And I want God to use me to help that message, the original message of this open book, to go to the world. I want that the whole Bible to be open to me now, and especially the books of Daniel and Revelation. He cried with a loud voice when, as with a lion roars. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, you can do the voice of lion, and you can see that there's 20 different times where you can see the voice of a lion is mentioned, or at least um, it's, it's dealt with in this idea. So notice when it's talking about the lion and voice, it, this one is really powerful, Isaiah 31 verse 4. Thus hath the Lord spoken unto me, like as the lion... And the young lion roaring on his prey, when a multitude of shepherds is called forth against him, he will not be afraid of their voice, nor abase himself for the noise of them. So shall the Lord of hosts come down to fight for Mount Zion, which is his people, and for the hill thereof. And so, like a lion is how God is going to come down and fight for his people. I love that verse. That's Isaiah 31 verse 4. And so he cries with a loud voice as with a lion roaring. And that means he's coming down fighting for his people. And when he had cried with a loud voice, the seven thunders uttered their voices. But when I, when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered and write them not. Now, why not? Well, we're told in uh, Christ triumphant. I think it's page 233 or 344.4. I think it's 344.4, where it says that, uh, this is Sister White commentating, uh, commentating that the uh, seven thunders are the experiences that would occur during the times of the first and second angels. Now, what does that mean? Well, it's in the 1840s. That's what that means. And so it's really quite interesting how all these things work together. And you can see how the prophecies are correlating and they're coming together in such a way that it's, it's beautiful to be able to see them all coming together in, um, from kind of like a, an upper, higher view, if you will. Instead of being in the midst of the trees, you're looking from above. And the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven, kind of like what you see in Revel uh, Daniel chapter 12. And he swear by him that lives forever, who created heaven, the things that are therein, and the earth, and the things which therein are, and the sea, and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. You have in Revelation chapter 10, you have a greater explanation of what was said by the angel standing with, in Daniel chapter 12, it was both hands raised. In Daniel uh, Revelation chapter 10, 
it is with one hand that has a book open and the other hand raised. So in Daniel chapter 12, you have an explanation of what happened. But in Revelation chapter 10, you have a greater explanation of what happened. You know what that means? To me, anyways. It means there is a, a revelation of truth, okay? This is a progressive revelation is what is, it's called in theological terms. But what it means is the light shines a little bit, kind of like the sun rising, right? The light, the light shines a little bit. And then pretty soon it's a little bit more, and it's a little bit more, and it's a little bit more. Pretty soon the sun is up and it's shining with its strength. You know, not quite as much as it would be if it were right above you. So the more the light shines, the, shi the brighter it becomes. And that's kind of the idea right here with Daniel chapter 12 and Revelation chapter 10. Revelation chapter 10 is describing a whole lot more detail than what was known in Daniel chapter 12. And why? Well, it's because God is giving the seven thunders, all of the thunders here, which the thunders, by the way, if you just go through and recognize what that's saying and what it means, it's two things in my mind. It's God's presence and his word. Like, for example, angels are referred to as going up and down from heaven as lightning in Ezekiel chapter 1. Well, lightning uh, is followed by thunder, right? <clears throat> what do angels do? Well, according to Genesis 28 verses 11 through 13, angels bring messages up and down on that ladder. That ladder represents Christ, the only mediator between God and men. So angels are bringing messages, which is the voice of the Father through his messengers, and they are like lightning, which brings thunder. Of course, that's the presence of God, that's the word of God, and it all mixes together. So here are the seven thunders. The, the full presence of God is what's declared there during the time of the first and the second angel. And so John was about to write it. He was all excited. And they said, nope, don't write that down because it's not for you. It's for them later. And that's why God was raising up another person that had the gift of prophecy in the 1840s, Sister White. And that was because she was going to be declaring a lot of things that they didn't know back during John's time when he was trying to hear the seven thunders and try to write down what he said. I mean, think about all the stuff that he would have written if he would have written all of what the seven thunders wrote, right, or said. And so that would be, uh, John would have written much more than just the book of Revelation. He would have had a whole bunch of books written out. Anyways, you see there in verse 10, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, so in the days, not in the day, but this is plural, days, in the time, in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, that means the angel's sound, and there is time that passes by, right? Yep. When he shall begin to sound. So he begins, and that must mean he ends. Well, when he begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. What is this mystery? The mystery of God is Christ in you, the hope of glory. If you study this phrase, mystery of God, you'll realize that it is the Spirit of the Father through his Son in you. And that is God, or the mystery of God, and it would be finished. That means God's people will actually be prepared for the coming of his Son. Why? Because of the voice of the seven thunders. And that would be the clear, final, true, like full revelation of God's truth. And this is as he had declared to his servants the prophets. So the mystery of God would be finished as is described in the Bible. Okay, the Bible is a part of finishing the mystery of God. Now, I just want to say again, it's John chapter 6, verse 63. One of my favorite verses. The words are spirit. The words are life. If you want the spirit and life of God in you, what do you do? You partake of his words. And that's why it's so important here that the mystery of God is finished as declared by his prophets, which is his word. Okay, so there's a connection here. The mystery of God, which is Christ in you, which is by his spirit, and he says, my words are spirit. If the word of God is living in you as it was living in his son, the mystery of God would be finished as was spoken by his word, the prophets. The voice which I heard from heaven spake to me again and said, Go, take the little book which is open in the hand of the angel, which is the book of Daniel, that little book that was sealed in the Old Testament, which stands upon the sea and upon the earth. And I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me that little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up, and it shall be in thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. 
Now this is very similar to Ezekiel chapter 2 and 3. You can study that for yourself in context of this verse, and you realize that the words of God were given to Ezekiel, and the words of God were what made his belly bitter. But they were also sweet to his mouth. And the same thing is here. This little book is the word of God. And Revelation, or John, is to be able to take it and eat it during that time. What time? During the 1840s. I took the little book and I out of the angel's hand and I ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. Christ is coming in 1844. But as soon as that I, I had eaten it, as soon as I realized that 1844 came and went, my belly was bitter. There was a great disappointment. That's what's described here during that time of the 1840s. He said unto me, Thou must prophesy again. Okay, well, what are we going to say again? It's going to be before many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings, just like the three angels' messages that go before many nations, peoples, tongues, and languages, right? So here we have um, the same thing, the same idea. Prophesy again to everybody, because you had that bitter, appoint, uh, bitter disappointment, you got to do it again. Okay, so what are we going to say? Well, here's what to say. There was given my, me unto a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise! Measure the temple. Okay, why? Well, what about it? Measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. So the temple, God, and them that are in it, right? Notice what the Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, verse 6. He op this is Antichrist. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name, his temple or his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Wait a minute. That sounds very similar to what we're supposed to prophesy about, right? We're supposed to prophesy about the temple of God, the altar, or, you know, the things that are therein, and them that worship therein. So if you connect this verse with Revelation chapter 13, verse 6, you realize that the enemy is going against the message that we are supposed to be prophesying again. And so, if you want to study what was originally taught in that 1844 movement or 1840s movement that's described in Revelation chapter 10, one of the things you'll understand better is the sanctuary. And you'll understand the prophecies that deal with the sanctuary, and you'll be able to understand better what those seven thunders uttered, the first and the second uh, angels and the activities and the teachings during that time. So I want to be part of that movement. I want to be part of God's people on this earth. And I think that Revelation chapter 10 is illustrating the ideas of that time and what that time was bringing into the world. And that's the message that's supposed to go again, prophesied again, to the whole world. Just like it was in 1844. I want to be part of that. I want to be part of that movement to preach the true message the real one that God has for his people. So let's bow our heads and ask that God will use us in every way to do what he wants to do for this world. Okay, so let's pray and ask God's blessings. Father, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to learn a little bit more of what it is that you've said here in Revelation chapter 10. I pray that you would bless us to help us understand a little bit more of what it is that we need to know and say and do, and how we can be transformed and brought into your um, kingdom, be part of your family, part of your ministry here in this earth. We thank you for leading us as you have, giving us the opportunity to know and do what you have said and done, and be merciful to us. Help us to be diligent and studious and willing to be just as you would have us to be. May we walk with your Son and with the angels, as described here, in Revelation chapter 10. Thank you for this and bless us in Jesus' name. Amen.